Okay, so let's go ahead and try and use our kinematic observations to develop a theory of bending of what we call symmetric beams. So again, just as a, a quick reminder, the, uh, the beam is a, a long slender system and it's going to be subjected to transverse loads and moments that are orthogonal to the long axis. Okay, so drawn in 3D over here, I have, say, a moment shown in blue or a, a force shown in red or maybe a distributed load shown in green here and all of these loads are orthogonal to the long axis which is the x-axis in this case and by slender what I mean is that the dimension in the x direction is much larger than the dimensions in the y and the z directions symmetric uh, in this case means that the cross section of the beam is symmetric with respect to a vertical axis so the y-axis in this case um, so the primary motion in these cases is going to be orthogonal to the long axis. That's going to be motion in the y direction. So those are the deflections. And this is kind of you know different than what we've had for tension compression bars. So in tension compression bars the load is along the long axis and the motion is along the long axis. And likewise for the torsion bar we had a moment that was along that the long axis, so it was parallel to the x-axis, or the z-axis, because that was the coordinate system that we used for torsion, and then the motion was also kind of along the axis, so we had rotation along the axis. So the difference here with beams is that the motion is all transverse to the long axis of the mechanical system. So that's the setup that we'd like to analyze now. Uh, and we're going to stick with the symmetric case, so we have a system, it's long, also the cross-sections will be prismatic, meaning that at any value of x we have the same cross-section. Uh, later on we'll relax that assumption. So this is just looking at the system from the side here and we have the x-axis which is our long axis, the y is transverse and the z-axis is coming straight out out of the page. Okay. Uh, the cross-section itself has a vertical line of symmetry so it'll be a symmetric with respect to the vertical axis and right now we'll just go ahead and assume that the coordinate system is placed in the center of the cross-section. Later on we'll talk about how you actually place the cross-section in these types of theories for bending of beams. Um, the primary kinematic observation that we had was that plane sections remain plane when you bend the beam and normals remain normal. So any 90 degree angles in the xy plane, they remain 90 degree angles in the xy plane. So between lines that are originally in the y direction or the x direction, they stay 90 degrees after, before and after deformation. So that's the, the two assumptions that we're going to try and build into a, a theory of deformation for beams. Uh, and basically, as we observed before, if I account for the vertical motion, which I'll call V of the center line of the bending of the beam, and the rotation of the cross section, that's really completely going to completely characterize the motion of all points in the beam. Uh, by the two assumptions that I have. So those V and W are going to be the primary unknowns in our problem. So unlike in the torsion and the axial force case where we only had one unknown field to figure out or determine f to characterize the full motion, here we're going to have two fields. There's going to be the deflection and the rotation. But we'll see in a second that they're linked to each other. And in particular, uh, because of the, the, the normals remain normal assumption, I have a connection between the rotation of the cross section and the deflection, namely that the slope, the derivative of v with respect to x, which I've indicated here with a prime, uh, is equal to the tangent of the angle. So that's just basic uh, calculus there. And if I assume small motion, small deformation, small strains, then I can approximate the tangent with the argument itself. So I end up with this, this relationship here, which says that the rotation of the cross section is just simply the slope of the deflection curve for the beam. Okay. Um, the other thing that's going to be useful in what we're going to do later is to talk about the curvature of the beam. And the curvature is the rate of change of the rotation of the beam as a function of arc length along the beam. And as long as we keep the deformation small, the arc length is the same as the position x. And so I can write that the curvature is just the derivative of the rotation field or the second derivative of the deflection field. So the primes here indicate differentiation with respect to x. So these are kinematic relationships that will be useful for us as, as we try and develop a full theory that describes the bending behavior of beams. Uh, the theory that we're going to describe here is well known as it's 
termed the Bernoulli Euler beam theory, and that's what people mean when people say Bernoulli Euler beam theory, they mean the theory of bending of beams where plane sections remain plane and normals remain normal. Uh, these assumptions, these observations about the kinematics are extremely robust. Uh, so they hold for you know standard metals uh, when they're elastic or elastomers and things like that. But even if the deformation of the beam is plastic, so you really bend it a lot, you see that the plane sections remain plane and the normals will remain plane. Uh, and even if you had composite cross sections, uh, these observations still hold to very good approximation. So the theory that we're going to develop here, this Bernoulli Euler beam theory, is uh, extremely robust. So let's first try and figure out what the strains are in the system. So let me go ahead and I'll just look at the problem in two dimensions. So in the xy plane, uh, so if I look at it in the xy plane, uh, then I'm going to go ahead and cut out a section of the beam of length delta x and we'll kind of do one of our differential uh, element calculations here to figure out what the strains are. So in 2D there are three strains that we need to determine. Uh, epsilon xx, which we are going to call the bending strain, that's the normal strain in the x direction. Epsilon yy, the normal strain in the y direction. And gamma xy, the shear strain in the xy plane. So these are the three strains that in principle we would have to develop. Uh, the shear strain gamma xy is going to be equal to zero because we have no angle changes. Remember the, the observation that normals remain normal, which means that there's no changes in the 90 degree angle between the x and the y coordinate lines. So that's going to tell us that there's zero shear in, in the beam in these situations. Um, we're going to go ahead and ignore the normal strain in the y direction. Uh, and that's for the same reasons that we ignored it uh, when we were doing the case of axial deformation of bars, so that sort of that plane stress energy argument. So really there's only one strain that we're going to have to worry about in bending and that's going to be epsilon xx. So we'll usually just write epsilon for that or epsilon b to emphasize that it is the bending strain or the strain that uh, occurs in the mechanical system due to bending loads. Uh, so let's go ahead and pull out our little section here delta x and I'm drawing in a little green line here on the element and so if I want to know what the normal strain in the x direction is I can look at this line of material that I've colored green here and calculate its change of length relative to its original length. So the original length here is delta x and after I bend it it's going to turn into some kind of curved object. So each side of my differential element is going to move up and down and it's also going to rotate and that's going to cause a change in length of this segment of material. So, and what we're after here is calculating the change in length over the original length. So L0, the original length here is delta x. And the change in length I can calculate by observing that each side of my differential element is going to have a different rotation. So on the left side I'm going to have a rotation theta uh, and it's according to whatever location I made the, the section cut at, so I'll call that generically x. And the right side is located at x plus delta x, so the rotation of that side will be theta of x plus delta x. And I need to calculate the change in length, so that's the new length divided by the old length. Uh, the old length is delta x, so I have this expression here which says new length minus the original length, delta x, divided by delta x, the, the original length, is going to give me the strain. And the only question is, is what is the expression for the new length? So the new length is going to be composed of two parts. One is a contraction of the length due to the rotation on the right side and an extension of the length due to a rotation on the left side. So let's look at the left side first. So the extension here is shown in, in pink here and that is going to be this distance right here. And that distance is, I can calculate for small rotations, is going to be the rotation angle times the distance from the center of rotation of the cross section. I don't really know what that is, but I know there is some point about which the cross section is going to rotate. So I'll go ahead and call that y. And so y times theta evaluated at x gives me the lengthening of this bit of material that I've colored green here. There's a shortening due to the rotation on the right side, so there's a minus sign here, and that's again the distance from the center of rotation, y times the rotation, which is theta evaluated at x plus delta x, and then I have to subtract that out of the, the original length. So that gives me 
a complete expression for the change in length divided by the original length for the line segment. Um, I can now go ahead and do the usual thing, which is take a limit as delta x goes to zero and cancel out the terms that are the same. And I find out that the bending strain is equal to minus y d theta dx, uh, which if I want to write in terms of the curvature, uh, which I had defined before, I have minus y kappa. So the bending strain just straight from our kinematic observations of plane sections remain plane and normals remain normal gives me an expression for the bending strain as minus y times kappa. Okay, so let's just go ahead and, and look at this again. So first of all, observe that as a function of y, the bending strains are a linear function. So if I plot the bending strain on the cross section as a function of y, I have a linear variation and it passes through a value of zero at the center of rotation. Okay, and the center of rotation is sometimes also known as the neutral axis. Okay, um, this relationship for the, the bending strains, epsilon is equal to minus kappa y, it occupies the same place in the theory of bending as we had gamma equals r d phi d z in the theory of torsion, or epsilon is equal to u prime in the theory of the axial deformation of rods. So it has that same kind of uh, fundamental place in the theory for bending. Uh, and the result, again, is a direct consequence of our kinematic assumptions and observations that we've made about bending. Um, and now let's just go back and talk a little bit about the center rotation idea. The location of the coordinate origin is, is on this line of center rotations, which is also known as neutral axis. But we still have to determine where that origin is. So the, the origin of the coordinate system here on the cross section, we really don't know what that is yet. It could be where I've drawn it there, or it could be down here. It can move anywhere on this vertical line of symmetry. But I don't really know what, what that location is just yet. So actually, we will have to determine that using other information about the system. And as we'll see in a little bit, we actually determine that from an equilibrium argument about the location of the coordinate system. So it's not necessarily right in the center of the cross section.